that of course has to do with the presence of the road and within the, the Stanley Center, but even before that to the genetics unit at NGA that has a history of gene discovery in a variety of disorders. But even among this very illustrious group, in my opinion, Ben Neal stands out as one of the young rising stars of statistical genetics. And uh, I knew about Ben from his PhD mentor, Mark Daly. And I understand that Ben came to Mark because his true PhD mentor at King's College in London left and Ben was hunting for, anyway, never mind. It's a long story, but he will tell you uh, at some point. But nonetheless, it was a great gain for, uh, for, for, for uh, Boston that uh, Ben has been here since his PhD and has continued here and is now a major player in the discovery of genes involved in neuropsychiatric disorder. Ben has a very rich CV. He's been a leader in the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium. He has developed new methods for the analysis of genetic data. He's been increasingly involved with genome-wide association data. Of course, before that, he's involved in major discoveries of rare variants. So we are very lucky to have, have Ben in our community and to be now deeply involved <coughs> with the discovery of autism genes, mm -hmm. which is, of course, one of the major pillars of the Simon Center. So Excellent. Thank you, McCrunker. Uh, and thank you all. So I'm, I'm going to basically give a talk in, in two halves. Uh, the, the first half will focus on really the contribution of de novo coding variation. And I, I think you know, genetics has been accelerating for the last decade. Uh, there's been a kind of phase change in the way we measure the genome, a phase change in terms of how much genetic variation we can look at, uh, first with genome-wide association and, and really capturing the vast majority of common variation across the population, and now with the kind of uptake of sequencing uh, technologies, we, we can kind of go completely across the allele frequency spectrum. And there are different analytic considerations and challenges that, you know, one has to confront when we kind of consider these different kinds of, of genetic variation. Uh, but I, I think after, you know, probably 30, 40, 50 years of very little in the way of traction or success with respect to gene finding and, and kind of robust genetic analysis for most neuropsychiatric traits, we're in this kind of frenzied discovery period where it seems that on this, you know, every other week there's new data to look at, new discoveries to be had, new genes that are identified, new variants that are identified. And they're coming from both common and rare variation. I just kind of want to tell you a little bit about how we think about those things and, and how we really start to interpret them, not only in the face of the increasing data uh, sets and sample sizes that are now available for phenotypes like autism and, and for uh, schizophrenia, uh, but also in the face of these, you know, kind of larger scale international efforts to really aggregate genetic data in an effort to improve our interpretation of the consequences of genetic variation, both common and, and rare. So let's start with de novo coding variation. And, and really, there's been a kind of increasing industry of these sorts of exome sequencing projects of, of autism spectrum disorders trios. And the general model here is pretty straightforward. You, you do sequencing, in this instance, exome sequencing, so really focused on the coding regions of the human genome. So we're, we're taking the, all of the exons and trying to capture as much of the rare variation as we can there uh, through, through sequencing. And you sequence both parents and then an affected offspring. And much of this sequence has been done on so-called simplex families, individuals where neither parent have, uh, or instances where neither parent has autism spectrum disorder and, and the <coughs> proband does, uh, but some of them are not, you know, quite simplex and there's some family history and those kinds of things, but, but nevertheless, the vast majority of this data has really been uh, focused on identifying these mutations that we do not see in either parent, but we do see in the, in the offspring. And the total sample size right now is around about 3,900, nearly 4,000 probands with, with autism. There's also been sister efforts to look at unaffected siblings. So there are about half as many unaffected siblings. Now these unaffected siblings serve as kind of a useful guideline for how we interpret our data, how we think about modeling these kinds of data sets, and, and how we think about kind of pursuing gene finding. So the first thing that you'd want to do, and, and this is work that really Caitlin Smoha, who's a PhD student with, with Mark, and, and Stefan Sanders, who's 
starting a, his, his group up at, at UCSF that worked with Matt State, is really look at just the overall rate of specific kinds of mutations found in the coding regions of the human genome to see whether or not there's an excess. Now, an excess is absolutely essential for there to be evidence for signal, okay? So if we do not see an enrichment of a given class of mutation, then the vast majority of those mutations do not influence risk. You may have poor power, and you may not have enough information to really delineate between that background rate and, and what you actually observe in your, your sample. But without an excess, there's really little hope of identifying genes or identifying variants. And so what we've got up here are the unaffected trios, <coughs> and we've broken this down into three different kinds of, of mutations, these synonymous mutations, which are you know, individual base pair changes in the coding region, whereby the same amino acid is going to be you know, kind of transcribed and then translated. So the, the transcript changes, but the translation is for the same amino acid. And for synonymous mutations, we have this kind of expectation uh, that we've defined here. So this is our expected column. We have what we observe in both the unaffected trios and, and our ASD cases. And the observed rate is pretty close to what we expect based on a mutation rate model that we built about three years ago now to try and evaluate the contribution of different classes of mutation to uh, kind of autism and, and, and others. And we don't see any real distinction between our expected rate from this mutation rate model and what we observe in the data. And that's good because these are synonymous mutations, mutations that are not expected to have very much in the way of phenotypic impact. They show very little evidence for natural selection when you do conservation across mammalian species. These are, are kind of neutral background mutations that we can use to calibrate our thinking. Now we can contrast that, again, so we use our unaffected you know, trios as an overall calibration for the overall model, right? So there is this background rate of de novo mutations. On average, there's a little more than one de novo point mutation or small insertion <coughs> deletion per individual. So about two thirds of the people in this room carry at least one de novo mutation in their coding region, okay? So that's like an important thing to remember. This background rate that happens naturally occurring in the population is not the kind of mutation that we're interested in actually identifying and evaluating the fun functional consequences are of. And that also implies that simply seeing one de novo mutation of any given kind is insufficient for us to be excited or enthusiastic or even confident about its role in, in a phenotype, even if we observe it in a case of something like autism spectrum disorder. So we have this model and we see that the overall rate of missense mutations and LOF mutations is effectively indistinguishable. So our, our model that we build based on the sequence context is actually reflecting what we see in unaffected siblings, which is encouraging. And then if we turn our attention to autism spectrum disorder, we see two things really popping out at us. So the first is that both the, the missense mutations are substantially higher in rate, as are these putative loss of function mutations, these stop codons that were not there before, or these frame shifting insertion deletion polymorphisms that are really knocking out one of two copies of a given gene. And that enrichment's pretty substantial, right? So we've got a kind of background rate of 0.62, so for every 100 trios, we'll expect to see about 62 missense mutations de novo arising in, in the population. And we're seeing, you know, if you do 100 autism spectrum disorder cases, you see about 70 such mutations. And that means that, you know, maybe something like eight or so percent of autism spectrum disorder cases likely carry an event that's actually relevant to their risk for disease. It might be slightly more than that. It gets complicated depending on how you model the risk. But we see that kind of enrichment for both missense and for loss of function mutations. And the significance that we assign to these is now absolutely unequivocal. When we were doing these studies in the earliest days on a couple hundred trios, three, four hundred trios, our p-values were, you know, kind of 10 to minus 2, 10 to minus 3, you know, kind of marginal. Now we're absolutely convinced not only of a role of these newly arising loss of function mutations that was the most easy and straightforward to establish, but also these missense mutations, okay? So this is like our signal. This is what we're going to try and pick apart. Now the punchlines are that out of these sets, there are around 50 or so genes in the human genome, if you knock them out, are extremely deleterious and confer an extremely high degree of risk to autism spectrum disorders. And we, we look at, we, we kind of create that kind of evaluation uh, based on looking at the overall number of genes with multiple hits. And there are about 30 or so genes that have multiple LOFs, 
aggregated across this 4,000 kind of trio set. And that, that set of genes is strongly enriched for genes that are really having a major impact on risk for autism. This is a tiny, tiny fraction of what we see with respect to autism spectrum disorder in the population. Okay? So this is a kind of somewhat pervasive phenomenon, but it's still very rare. And as a consequence of being very rare, is not doing much in the way of explaining a huge amount of risk for autism spectrum disorders in the population. There's not only this small set of genes that are, have odds ratios of you know, 20, 30, 40, or maybe even 100, so nearly almost fully penetrant mutations in, in, in genes. There are hundreds of other genes that have much more modest risk, things that have odds ratios of 3, 4, 5, maybe even less than that, 1 and a half, those kinds of things, these more subtle increases in risk. And that's kind of probably a lot of the kind of genetic variation in, in spectrum that we're going to start to see when we turn our attention to common variation and, and hunting for common variation in, in the GWAS paradigm. It is also worth bearing in mind that the vast majority of cases do not have a coding de novo mutation that is relevant to their phenotype. Okay? Right? So this is not an instance where the overwhelming majority of our patients are, you know, being driven by these kinds of de novo loss of function or de novo missense mutations in, in genes. And, and that, that varies depending on the kind of phenotypes that you look at in the, the spectrum of, the, uh, the, of, of phenotypes. So Elise Robinson, who's an instructor at APGU and uh, kind of uh, trained as an epidemiologist, uh, has done a lot of really beautiful work really trying to finesse out what's going on with respect to uh, secondary phenotypic information. And we've looked at a number of secondary phenotypes to try and in interpret and, and interrogate what the consequences at a phenotypic level are of these kinds of mutations. And the best stratifier we have at a case level is taking IQ. Okay, so what we have plotted here on the x-axis is the IQ, the full-scale IQ for our ASD probands. And then on the y-axis, we have this de novo loss of function mutation rate. Okay. Now, what we have up here, around about 0.24, is the rate of de novo LOS that you see in patients with severe intellectual disability. So there are a couple of projects that are really driven on this, uh, the most notable of which is the DDD project out of the Sanger. So that's up here. Then we have our overall autism spectrum rate over here. And then there's the rate that we see in schizophrenia, and then our expected rate overall. This regression line that Elise has drawn is what we see across the autism case collection where we have IQ measured. Okay, so if we look at patients with you know, IQs in the range of 50 or so, they've got a rate that's not too dissimilar from what we see with intellectual disability. We can contrast that with patients with autism spectrum disorders that have IQs at about 100 or even 125, and that rate of mutations is beginning to come more in line with what we have as an expectation. And so what this is suggesting is that there's not only an impact on risk for autism spectrum disorders for these kinds of mutations that we're seeing, but also overall cognition. Now, you know, IQ is not a perfect measure. You can have lots of complaints with IQ, and, and I'm not going to dwell too much on uh, the measurement properties of those sorts of things, but overall cognitive ability is being influenced by these severe mutations as well. And it's very difficult for us to disentangle whether this is a scenario where it is comorbid intellectual disability and autism spectrum disorders that's being driven by these mutations, or it's a scenario where if you have intellectual disability, then you're, it's a kind of axis and exposure for autism spectrum disorders and being pulled into that at a clinical diagnosis way, or something you know, kind of in between. Okay, so that's the kind of big picture on risk, but I think we can do a little bit better. And, and one of the most informative ways that's kind of recently emerging to really narrow the focus on, on a set of genes and, and really highlight things that are probably extremely likely to have strong biological consequences is not only simply through pursuing exome sequencing in autism cases and their parents and doing this de novo variant identification, it is also through leveraging large-scale exome aggregation consortium data. So the exome aggregation consortium data has been focused on drawing together exome sequencing data that is in the community writ large. Aggregating this, harmonizing it, calling it in an identical fashion, and then serving up this overall kind of data set to the 
entire community, both for complex trait analysis, like I'm going to describe here, uh, but also for clinical genetics evaluation and, and you know, identification of severe neurodevelopmental disorders or developmental delay and, and kind of filtration of mutations along those kinds of lines. So Johnny MacArthur, who's the other faculty member at APG, along with myself and, and, and Mark Daly, uh, he and, and Monka Leck have really spearheaded this heroic effort to do this aggregation and harmonization. And right now we have a, a data set that's available online. You can Google XAC and look up standing genetic variation in the population in the coding regions of 60,000 individuals. Okay, so this is a really powerful resource uh, more generally. And, and it really focuses, you know, it's primarily European, but we're beginning to see much more in the way of diversity creep in. And I think that's another thing that we should prioritize as a community is these kind of efforts to really expand the diversity of the genetic studies, both in terms of boosting power for gene finding in some ways, but also because of the implications that it has for the delivery of genetic information into clinical application. Okay, so first off, Jack Kosmicki, who's another PhD student in the group, uh, you know, one of the things that we saw early on in the context of analyzing the kind of de novo mutations was something like 15% or so of the mutations that we observed de novo, so newly arising, not seen in the parents, but seen in the offspring, is that they had DD SNP numbers, so that they were already seen mutations. Well, when we expand the amount of genetic variation that we're looking at by expanding the sample size, we're now in a scenario where approximately a third of all of the de novo mutations that have been identified in the autism sequencing you know, consortium and the Simon sequencing consortium, these two efforts put together, uh, are seen in, in XAC, okay? So that is to say we see the exact same mutation as standing variation in some other individual that has gone through exome sequencing, and there are no cases of autism spectrum disorder, to the best of our knowledge, in XAC, so it's not a question of contamination in that direction. A third of these mutations are already out there in the population. And that's actually not that surprising. You know, there are six plus billion people on the planet. We've got 3.3 billion base pairs. You expect about 60 de novo point mutations. Basically, every base pair in the human genome is probably variable in the population writ large at this point in time, unless it's incompatible with life. Okay, so this is maybe not so much of a surprise, but maybe it can be useful in terms of figuring out what's going on. So if we look at our ASD probands, overall, we're seeing a slightly lower fraction of these mutations in XAC compared to our unaffected siblings, but still somewhere in the neighborhood of about a third of these mutations. So can we like finesse out the signal? Can we do any better taking these kinds of large scale external data resources? And the answer for synonymous mutations is exactly what you would hope. There's fundamentally no difference in the rate of mutations between autism spectrum disorder cases and unaffected siblings for synonymous mutations. Remember, these are our neutral mutations. These are our baseline controls that we are not, you know, thinking or contributing risk. And so when we look at the overall rate, we see no real difference in the rate of these mutations between our ASD cases in purple and the, the rate in, in green here for our unaffected siblings. You split that out by those that are observed in EXAC for synonymous mutations and those that are not observed in EXAC for our synonymous mutations. And the difference, there's no difference in that rate. And that's very encouraging. That means that, you know, there's no signal and there's no signal all the way through. That's quite, that's quite a good sign. If we turn our attention instead to the protein truncating variants, these are our LOFs, our putative LOFs, the story changes quite radically. Okay, so here we move from our overall excess, this is our 14% to our about our, you know, eight and mumble percent uh, of, of cases with ASD versus our unaffected siblings. When we take a look at those mutations that are observed in EXACT, there's really no fundamental difference in the rate. You'll note that it's a much smaller fraction of the mutations. Many more of all possible synonymous mutations are seen in EXAC compared to putative loss of function or protein truncating variants. But when you look at the ones that aren't in EXAC, that actually strengthens the signal. So we move this difference from a 10 to the minus 9 to a 10 to the minus 13. Okay, so we're really sharpening our focus here by taking external data resources and saying those mutations that are standing in the population, those LOFs that exist in the population that we've already seen before are less <coughs> likely, are, don't show much at all in the way of risk for autism spectrum disorders 
in, con in contrast to those that are really newly arising in the family and not seen in these large-scale external data resources. We can also do one other thing. So uh, one, of, one of the things that we've been also working on with this mutation rate model and, and looking at large-scale exome sequencing projects for, again, the last three, four, five years, is this idea of taking the expected number of mutations of each kind of variant class and comparing that to what we observe in terms of standing variation. So population genetics has a, a long history of using reduction of diversity, so uh, an instances where we see fewer genetic variants in the population than we would expect based on the mutation rate as a signature of natural selection. Right? And that makes sense. So places where mutations are being pushed out of the population, that purifying selection is acting, where we don't want to see those changes because they cause you know, unfortunate consequences and they are deleterious to the individual's reproductive fitness, selection is going to be acting on those. It's going to be drawing those mutations out of the population. And so we do exactly the same conceptual thing here of take our expected mutation rate. We, we take this expectation and we contrast it with what we observe in terms of the standing variation now in XX. So this is something that Mark and I and, and Caitlin have been working on together for, I don't know, the last three or four years since almost the entirety of Caitlin's PhD. So here for synonymous mutation, we have pretty good correlation. You know, these gray dots, X, X follows Y pretty well. Our model is doing a pretty good job. For missense mutations, we're beginning to see this kind of bulge down here. Those are genes for which missense mutations are being more aggressively selected out of the population compared to the baseline. And then if we turn our attention to these protein truncating variants or loss of function, we see this really big smear over here. So these are genes where we observe basically zero loss of function mutations in the population. And there's a much higher expectation based on the overall probability of mutation that we see based on the sequence context itself. We can take this kind of framework and turn it into a probability of loss of function intolerance. Okay, so this is what Caitlin's been working on explicitly. And it's, it's basically identifying those genes that are extremely strongly enriched for this lack of loss of function mutations in the population. Okay, so there's, there's this utter depletion of these LOF variants where we would expect to see them. And if we take our PLI genes, our you know, kind of 10% or so of genes that are these PLI genes, we can then ask the question of what fraction of genes have a PLI greater than 0.9. So we kind of assign this in a two-class probability way. So we say either you're loss of function intolerant or you're not, and we, we kind of build that. And so the, the kind of things with severe haploinsufficiency are strongly enriched for PLI genes, these genes that are deficient of these loss of function mutations. There are a variety of other gene sets that you can use drawn from OMIM, things like uh, the dominant genes or the so-called essential genes from kind of mouse knockout models, what are incompatible with life. And we're seeing really big enrichment overall of this kind of fraction of uh, PLI greater than, than, than 0.9. So what we're going to do with this PLI is layer it on top of our uh, XDAC analysis. So you remember we did that XDAC analysis trying to contrast those LOF mutations that we observe in EXAC versus those LOF mutations that we don't observe in EXAC. If we take our not in EXAC LOF set and split it into our PLI less than 0.95 and PLI greater than 0.95, what we see is that we get a much stronger odds ratio, an odds ratio of about 3.4. And that concentrates the signal. Okay, so this way of zeroing in on a specific set of genes, these are the genes that we are highly confident to be carrying the vast majority of risk being introduced from putative loss of function mutations. Okay, so that's, that's the general idea and that's the general framework. And a lot of these genes are genes that you would expect. You know, they're things like, you know, SCN2A or, you know, ARID1B or, or SYNGAP, things that are, you know, clearly documented as causing very, very severe phenotypes in the population, not only through these experiments looking at autism spectrum disorders, but also through other, you know, kind of more historical OMIM style analyses uh, going back the last 20, 30 years. So what happens when we look at the relationship with IQ in this scenario? Well, we see exactly the same thing preserved, but only for those things that are not in EXAC. Okay, so those protein truncating <coughs> variants that are observed in EXAC, the overall rate's flat with respect to IQ. There's no coupling of that relationship whatsoever. 
If we take a look at what's going on with those that are not in XAC, we're seeing exactly the same pattern that we saw before. Again, a secondary phenotypic validation of this overall principle that we can <coughs> use these things to improve and sharpen our focus on a set of genes and mutations that we think are relevant to disease. We can also ask questions about inherited mutations. This is like protein truncating variants that are transmitted from parents to offspring, because there's still all of that that we can look at anyway. And remember, a lot of these mutations aren't fully penetrant. So the you know, parents will carry them. They may not have full-blown phenotypes. They'll just be subclinical threshold or you know, have some compensatory mechanisms or, or whatever. And, and we can do exactly the same kind of analysis. So we can look at our de novo variants up here. This is a, in tabular form rather than in graphical form. And then if we look at it, the inherited mutations, right? So it's still a, a pretty small set. So our inherited of 284 versus 220, we get an odds ratio of 1.4. So there's still some residual risk, but being an inherited variant is probably less meaningful than being a de novo variant on average when you are not observed in <coughs> exact. When we look at the rest of the variation, and this is a good you know, sanity like reminder of how much we have to look at with respect to standing genetic variation in the population, there are 14,000 heterozygote LOS, protein truncating variants, and there's no difference between the rate at which they're inherited versus not inherited in the population. So this is a kind of per individual rate, since you know, half are inherited and half aren't. Okay? So that's kind of where we're evolving our thinking in terms of really trying to identify genes using XM sequencing studies in autism spectrum disorders and how we're, we're leveraging external data resources to really give you know, a higher confidence set of genes. Uh, happy to you know, share, share results and, and all those sorts of things. But, but before um, I kind of turn to common variation, it's worth remembering that these kinds of analyses and these kinds of approaches Will I identify a set of genes that are going to have some pretty wide-ranging biological consequences? So in the kind of Derubia et al. de novo paper, there's a series of kind of biological network and, and kind of annotation analyses that were pursued. And a lot of the genes that are being identified as these major drivers are things like histone methyltransferases or things that are having a, a wide cascade of biological effects, likely in a developmental context, because you know we're de dealing with a developmental uh, disorder here. Uh, the biology, that's going to be hard, right? I mean, it's going to be hard to fix. It's going to be extremely hard to fully interpret it. And it's actually even going to be hard to narrow down which of the cascades that are set off by these master regulators are actually driving the pathogenic processes. I, I, and it is worth keeping that in mind. It makes seeing an effect in your biological assay easier, but the kind of interpretability and the real resolution of that biological deficit that you really want to target when thinking about therapeutics is much harder to identify and, and, and understand. That is worth bearing in mind. And, and Ed is nodding his head and you know he's like, yes, thumbs up. You know, you've taught me well, Dr. Skullman. Okay, so let's talk about the contribution of common variation because I think it's important to remember that, you know, I talk to people that don't live in, in the genetics world all the time, and they're like, oh, autism, it's all rare variation, right? And, and actually, no. So there's this really lovely paper in Nature Genetics from, uh, you know, Joe Buxbaum and Bernie Devlin, uh, led by uh, Gaugler et al. in 2014. And, and this is a kind of uh, circle chart, a pie chart of some form, looking at ASD liability. Okay, so this is the overall risk to autism spectrum disorders in the population. And what you have up here is unaccounted for. We don't know what's going on up here. That's our blue, that's 42%. But then down here, there's this common inherited variation piece. This about half of the variability and liability in the population, according to this paper, is estimated to be driven by common variation. I think it's probably a little bit rosy of an estimate, but nevertheless, it's a substantial fraction no matter how you kind of take a look at it. There's 3% that's kind of rare inherited variation, and then maybe a smidgen of de novo and a smidgen of, of non-additive genetic effects that you can identify at this point in time, okay? But that means that there's a lot to be found in this common variant landscape. Now, when talking about you know, GWAS and talking about psychiatric disorders, I still uh, like to use the object lesson of schizophrenia, okay? And this is a really important object lesson in how this works, okay? So, uh, schizophrenia GWAS, this is the International Schizophrenia Consortium. What we're going to have is a series of these Manhattan plots. So this is the minus log 10 p-value for each SNP association scattered across the genome. 
And then here's our, our red line of significance, our 5 times 10 to the minus 8, whereby we think that things are very likely to be real if they're above this line, and we're not so sure if they're below this line. This red line is based on effectively the number of tests that we're doing, around about a million independent tests, give or take when you do a GWAS. So at 2,600 cases and 3,300 controls, you do GWAS to schizophrenia, you don't see any genome-wide significant loci. Right? So that means, obviously, that you know, common variants aren't contributing anything to schizophrenia. Well, obviously not, because I'm going to continue to talk about it, but uh, that, that could be like a series of conclusions that are drawn at this point in time. And then, you know, kind of on the heels of this and, and other kinds of pieces of work, Pat Sullivan kind of dragged a lot of the psychiatric genetics community together to really build the Psychiatric Genetics, now Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, uh, focused on really driving up sample sizes across psychiatric disorders to do variant discovery. And this has been characterized by data sharing, as extensive data sharing as is possibly allowed through, you know, human subjects protections and privacy. Uh, the current chair of the schizophrenia group is Mick O'Donovan, and then Stefan Ripka is one of the kind of lead main analysts for the PGC, worked in, in Mark's lab with myself and Mark and Sean Purcell and myself and all the kind of other cast of characters in the PGC stats group, came together to kind of define best practices for processing this kind of GWAS data so that we can really scale up the activity. We can really drive forward this because if there's something, you know, when we think about 2,600 cases and 3,300 controls, that's a big study, no matter how you slice it, right? If it's like $1,000 a patient for ascertainment, typically, so if you collect samples in a clinical setting, you tend to spend something like $1,000 a patient, give or take. So that puts into perspective what the kind of collection of this sort of case number would really look like. And this has been amortized over a long period of time because a lot of people have been collecting a lot of samples. And there are ways of making it you know, simpler and, and, and cheaper, but that gives you some way of conceptualizing what the, the kind of magnitude and scale of the operation necessary <coughs> it is to really you know, kind of make some kind of impact. Okay, so PGC, the, the past in 2011, 9,000 cases, 12,000 controls. This was published in 2011 in Nature Genetics, which Stefan is the, the lead author. And, and the, the first kind of handful of genome-wide significant loci started to emerge. And as you continue to increase sample sizes, this is exactly what you would see, is that you would start to see these Manhattan plots looking more like Manhattan, these genome-wide significant loci emerging, 62 loci at 2012, 2013 freeze that was really formed the basis of the paper that we published in Nature last year, of 35,000 cases in the initial discovery, 97 genome-wide significant loci, and then if you include replication, you go all the way up to 108 individual loci, 128 variants that meet genome-wide significant threshold for significance. Now this is taking something on the order of like 37,000 cases, including replication, <coughs> to get to that sort of level of, of, of analysis. And what it, the reason that I, I highlight this is because this isn't specific to schizophrenia, so Mark McCarthy wrote a really nice paper in Nature <coughs> Review Nephrology. And, and has kind of recreated this picture, and conveniently this arrow isn't too far away from where the arrow is for, for autism. And this is looking at the effective sample size here on the, the x-axis, and then the number of loci that you identify on the y-axis. And each of these dots represent either papers or, or freezes of the kind of various analyses that, that were available at different sample sizes. And what you can see across a wide range of complex traits and autism spectrum disorders just like schizophrenia, just like type 2 diabetes, just like inflammatory bowel disease, just like type 1 diabetes, like take your pick of these large public health common complex diseases, they pretty much all follow exactly the same trajectory. We spend, you know, years in the wilderness trying to get sufficient sample sizes to start to gain traction in locus identification. We continue to add more and more samples, and as we add these samples, we start to identify loci. And so, yep, you had a question? Okay. So, can you explain why all the curves all of a sudden, like... Zoom off? Yeah. Yes, it's a good question. So is it like a, you all of a sudden increase the false detection? No, so, so the, each, you know, the, the probability of false positive is identical at this sample size as it is at this sample size, okay? So when you do an experiment, the chance that you get a p-value of 
is pretty much identical as long as you have sufficient numbers of individuals. What we're seeing is hundreds of small genetic effects start to get exposed as we increase sample size. And this is really the core message that is coming from the common variant analysis, that there are hundreds to thousands of loci scattered across the genome, each of which exerts a very subtle perturbation on risk, so odds ratios of like 1.1, 1.2, 1.05, .1 and there are hundreds to thousands of these kinds of effects for basically every complex trait that is out there. Okay? And, and what, is, what is happening is that we're just beginning to get the largest of those such effects. There's a distribution of effects, some bigger, some smaller. Um, and these are just the kind of leading edges of those effects. And then as we increase the sample size, we start to reveal more and more of these loci. So that's not just for schizophrenia. It's also for things like IBD. This is inflammatory bowel disease right there. Or type 2 diabetes over here and, and, and those kinds of considerations. OK, so this is just these first loci that are identifying those are the leading edge. They're the kind of indications that if you start to increase your sample size, you might actually start to, to break the, the kind of disease open. You might kind of crack open variant discovery. And it's also worth remembering that each of these individual loci point to a specific biological perturbation that we just have to be clever enough to interpret. Right now, we lack the tools to interpret the biological consequences of these variants. But if we can gain that ability, if we can understand what biological functionality these genetic variants are having, this can now provide entirely new hypotheses for what the pathogenic processes are that are driving these diseases. And that's why it's so exciting right now to be a geneticist, is because, you know, being down here, this is where we've spent the last 100 years, like as geneticists. Like, we've just been here. Uh, and now it's like, hey, you know, that promise of genetics, we're beginning to finally start to, to, to deliver. OK, so this is about ASD. And so we're going to talk about where we are with autism spectrum disorders in the context of common variation. And, and there's 5,300 trios. And, you know, maybe one locus, it kind of looks a little janky. You know, we'll see. But uh, this is the kind of first major effort from the PGC on the autism spectrum disorder side. Uh, people like Rick Annie and, and Dan Arking, along with Mark Daly and Bernie Devlin, have been leading these, these kinds of efforts. Um, but, you know, 5,000 cases, 5,000 trios, isn't really sufficient to do the job. It's not taking us over here. It's more like we're over here, and that's not kind of where we need to be. So the PGC uh, kind of banded together in collaboration and support from the Stanley Center and from Mount Sinai School of Medicine to basically design uh, the psych chip. Okay? And so Jackie, who's a research scientist in, in my group, and, and Stefan and myself worked with Jennifer Moran, who's the, uh, one of the kind of executive directors of the Stanley Center with, with Pamela Sklar, who's at Mount Sinai, um, to really try and design a genotyping platform that would enable us to scan, to scan very large sample sizes for common variants, as well as take a look at the standing exomic variation that's in the population, and then a bunch of targeted variation really aimed at regions where we have identified either genome-wide significant loci or sub-threshold loci that we think might convert from basically every meta-analysis of every psychiatric disorder that we could get our hands on or with a couple of other things in mind, trying to pepper regions of copy number variation of interest and, and a variety of other things. And there's a slide deck online. If you Google psych chip, you'll, you'll find uh, the slide deck for, for more uh, description therein. OK, and so what have we done in terms of production? So over the course of the last, I'd say, about year and a half uh, or so, uh, we've generated something on the order of 112,000 samples worth of genome-wide association data with, in particular, a substantial increase in the autism spectrum disorders uh, numbers. So there are 13,000 additional cases of autism spectrum disorder that are available <coughs> for analysis and integration into these genome-wide association meta-analyses. Now, 13,000 is, is like an impressive number. And what we did in this instance was actually, rather than try and do clinical ascertainment in you know, medical systems, we partnered with a country. So there's a partnership with the Serum Institute of Denmark. And uh, I'd just like to take a moment to flag Mads uh, Holligard, who recently passed away this year. Um, but Mads basically spent his entire scientific career devoted to taking Guthrie cards. So those cards that you use for neonatal screening for metabolic disorders, the kind of 13 metabolic disorders 
things like PKU. So you do the heel prick and then you get blood spots. So about 30 years ago, a little over 30 years ago, 32, 33 years ago, the head of the SSI at the time decided that it was a good idea to save all of these Guthrie cards because he, I think, believed that there would be some way to use these Guthrie cards in future to further research and understanding and really epidemiology at an unbiased population level. He stored all of these Guthrie cards in minus 20 degree C freezers, okay? I mean, just think about the foresight. This is before any of the high, throu high throughput technologies that we have in this day and age. He knew in his bones that this was a good idea. You talk to some other people, he's maybe a little bit of a hoarder, but you know, <laughs> not totally unexpected, but we, we thank him for his service because without that it would be impossible. And so Mads spent his entire career working on projects related to mining these kinds of resources. So he developed a protocol for whole genome amplification that could take DNA extracted from these Guthrie cards and make them work on modern array technology. So if you were around in the early days of whole genome amplification, it was horrible. It was, it was a disaster. You'd get these karyotypic abnormalities, you'd lose chromosomes and arms of chromosomes, massive deletions would arise. It was really, really terrible. Uh, but but Mads kind of cracked the way to do it, and that enabled us to kind of basically extract and amplify over 80,000 samples worth of DNA, including, importantly, around about 15,000 cases of autism spectrum disorder. And so it's really a, a big hats off to, to Matt Hollegard and, and David Hugard's the current kind of head of that side of the, the SSI. This was done in close collaboration with something called the Eyesight Consortium. So this is a set of five <coughs> PIs over here. Prebenbo Mortensen, who's the kind of main PI, and Andres Borlum, and Thomas Weyer, Ole Morris, and Merit Nordentoff. They came together and there's a, a kind of a substantial investment from the Lundbeck Foundation to really drive forward research into identifying risk factors for common psychiatric disorders, including schizophrenia, bipolar, autism spectrum disorder, major depression, and, and, and ADHD. And so that now gives me the kind of pleasure and in some ways the honor of flagging that this PGC ASD collection, plus the Danish blood spot you know, collection, uh, gets us to about 17,000 cases and the first handful of genome-wide significant loci emerging. Okay, so we're now on this path with respect to autism spectrum disorders that you know we haven't been in a long time. And the reason that I kind of give you this contrast is that it's both through searching rare variation and really applying ourselves to interpret the consequences of, of rare coding variation through exome sequencing, coupled with these common variant analyses, we're gonna to start to knit together a much more comprehensive view of what the likely biological players are in risk for autism spectrum disorders in the population. Okay, so we're on the right path now. What's required is further substantial increases in sample size. Same thing that's the true with respect to schizophrenia holds for autism spectrum disorders. If we got to 17,000 samples, cases, and we weren't finding anything, maybe we would like to try and reevaluate our, our kind of considerations a little bit, but that's not the way that this is played out. And, and this is, yes, Dennis. Uh, I was wondering if this um, has an overlap with IQ uh, loci? Yeah, uh, we, see, at a loci level, not sure. At a locus level, not sure. There's some very modest correlation with educational attainment with respect to common variant risk. Okay. So the last thing that I'm going to talk about for the last you know, five minutes or so uh, and, try and try and whiz through is this idea of how we can start to use the common variant contribution to disorders like autism spectrum disorder to gain further insight into what's actually going on. How do these different phenotypes relate? When you're talking about psychiatry and psychology, most of the constructs that we have are sort of like well, I kind of think it should be this way, and I'll get together a committee, and we all kind of agree that it should be this way, and then five years later, we'll get together another committee where we'll disagree with a little bit of what's going on, and then like continue, and, and now we have the DSM, and then we'll keep iterating on that, and on and on and on and on. So it is possible that we could start to maybe use genetics to try and uh, refine this. Now, the major ap you know, approach to this is something we call LD score regression. And I'm not going to try and get too technical. I just want to give you some sort of idea, some sort of additional evidence that would support the concept that common variation is pervasively contributing risk across diseases 
for, for basically every complex trait that we happen to look at. And so this was work led by Brendan Bulick Sullivan, who is a PhD student in my group, and Hilary Finucane, who's a PhD student in Alcas's group, and then Mark and, and, and Peru working all together with myself um, to really think about how LD, correlation between genetic variation, shapes association. And what we see here is these LD blocks, these regions of high genetic correlation. So these markers are correlated and traveling together in the population. And when you do an association test, if you have a causal variant that lands in one of these LD blocks, you see association not just to the variant, but also to the block itself. Okay, so that association reaches out across all of the things being correlated. Now the reason that that's important is that if you have an association to a lonely SNP, you have to have association to that variant. That variant has to be the functional variant. But it also holds that when you have many such associations, if we have lots and lots of small causal effects scattered across the, the genome, then we're going to see this emergent relationship that the more genetic variation you tag, the higher the chance you tag a causal variant, the more association on average you will see. Okay, so that's just the, the, the logical chain of custody. So lots of small genetic effects. If you tag a lot of genetic variation, you are more likely to tag a causal variant, and that means you show more association on average. And that makes a prediction about the relationship between the amount of LD and the amount of association. And so when we simulate this, we simulate random small effects scattered across the genome. We then run our regression, and we see this positive <coughs> relationship emerge. We can contrast that with population stratification, instances where we just got bias. But in instances where everything's driven by bias from population differences and genetic drift, there's no longer this relationship between amount of association and amount of tagging. Now we can just test this by doing a GWAS of the UK versus Sweden, controls from both populations, and we see the same inflation in our test statistics. We see you know, more association on average than we would expect, but we don't see this relationship. Now, when we do this for schizophrenia, we see this, okay? This, this picture here, the more genetic variation you tag, that's what we have a measure of on the x-axis, means the more association you see on average on the y-axis. This picture means unequivocally that there are hundreds to thousands of small genetic effects scattered across the genome that are influencing risk for schizophrenia. Now we can take this kind of slope, this kind of approach, and turn it into an estimator of heritability. I'm not going to belabor the equation, but basically this is now an estimator of heritability, the amount of variability in the population and liability attributable to these common genetic variants. Okay? So this is an estimator of heritability. And so that means that we can use this slope to estimate the heritability. That's the same kind of slope of LD score, the amount of genetic variation that you're tagging versus the amount of association that you see. <coughs> You can see that for a single trait. You can add a second trait to that. But then importantly, the product of the z-scores, the product of these association test statistics, gives you something that should be distributed like a chi-square. And in the event that there's a genetic correlation, there's an overlap in the genetic influences between these two traits, then we'll see a slope that is also deviating from that flat line. Okay? So if two traits are related to each other, if they share some of their genetic effects, we're going to see this same sort of slope emerge, not only for their univariate analyses, but also the product of disease. Okay? So this is what would happen if you have no genetic correlation. Now, the reason that this is nice is that we can take things like social communication measures. Okay? So this is work from the Avon Longitudinal Study of Parents and Children, or called ALSPAC, led by Beata St. Uh, Forcan with George Davy Smith and others. And this is the distribution of a social communication disorders checklist. Okay, so these are traits focused on social communication. All right, so how much you know, you're interacting with your peers and those kinds of questions, what kinds of difficulties you have and those sorts of things. You can read about them in this series of papers. But some nice work that Elise did using this genetic correlation framework is show that not only do we see a genetic correlation, we see a genetic correlation between what we call clinical autism. So this autism spectrum disorders and this quantitative trait in the population measuring social communication. The genetic correlation isn't great, it's 0.3, but it's non-zero. So that means that some aspects, some component of our clinical phenotype, our autism spectrum disorder diagnosis, is shared with <coughs> continuous variation in the population, 
of how communicative you are, how much eye contact you make, things like that. So this, more, this spectrum is real, and it really spans the entire distribution of the population, not just our, our clinical population as we define it right now. We also see that there's evidence for significant genetic correlation, albeit modest, between autism spectrum disorders and schizophrenia in the population. Okay, so there's some sharing in genetic risk factors between this very early neurodevelopmental disorder and a slightly later onset, you know, late adolescence, early adulthood sort of onset psychiatric disorder. Similarly, you know, non-zero but also not so significant, but potentially will convert evidence with respect to major depressive disorder and then even weaker still with respect to bipolar disorder. But think about that. I mean, these continuous scales may also be able to teach us something, at least with respect to the common variant risk, about what influences are shared and what are relevant in terms of a social communication point of view with autism spectrum disorders more generally in the population. So with that, I'd like to conclude and really acknowledge you know, substantial contributions from the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, uh, the NIMH, NHGRI, the Stanley Center, the Simon Center, you know, the uh, Simons Foundation and, and all of the other kind of patients and funders and people that have contributed to this work. And with that, I'll say thank you and open the floor for a few questions. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, you talked a lot about genetics and uh, the preclinical studies of using rat models and the correlation like the, um, in your idea of your opinion, uh, what's the, uh, the most uh, rat model that could be uh, most representative to have a preclinical study? That is a difficult question. So, so my personal preference for the role of animal models in terms of these activities is really in investigation of bi basic biological mechanism. Okay, so I'm, I personally, I'm not a fan of like, this animal has strange cleaning behavior. We're going to call that, you know, some psychiatric disorder. That that's that uh, that doesn't sit well with me. Um, but or some they they have strange sniffing behavior. I, I don't know. I I I'm uncomfortable with the anthropomorphizing of animals to create these models. I'm much more comfortable with here is you know so so Jim Noonan did some work uh, on knocking out CHD8 and. Or, or not knocking out CHD8, taking CHD8, finding where in the genome it binds in mouse neuron, and then asking whether that set of genes is enriched with respect to risk for autism spectrum disorder, or you know, with respect to risk for autism spectrum disorders in the de novo mutations. So here what we're doing is we're taking the basic biological mechanism, the fact that where CHD is bind, CHD8 is binding, and what is it doing at a biological level, and asking whether we can pull through risk and see that enrichment in risk in, in the human genetic studies. And I think that's a much more natural partnership, is to use these animal models in the ways that I think make more sense, molecular mechanism, uh, you know, toxicity, those kinds of things, rather than trying to recapitulate human phenotypes, since you know, mice and rats don't have much in the way of a prefrontal cortex, for example, and we kind of expect that the prefrontal cortex might be important in a lot of you know, higher level cognitive functions and, you know, on and on and on and on and on. So for invasive biological analysis and things like expression and things like that, I think there's tremendous value. I think in terms of recapitulating the phenotypic presentation of humans, much, much more difficult. Uh, well, we'll start here. You mentioned that the, um, the uh, study of the search for de novo uh, mutations has been mainly done by using exome, uh, whole exome sequencing. Mm -hmm. Would you expect that as, as, as we move to whole genome sequencing that there will be many more of those in non-coding regions? Or yeah, well, so yes and no. Uh, so, so there will be many more such mutations, but our ability to really zero in on those mutations that we understand as having functional consequences is extremely poor, right? The, the biggest critique of GWAS right now is, well, you find these associations great, you don't know how to interpret them, you suck, that's meaningless, right? Like that's just generally the conversation that we have when we identify these genome-wide significant loci. And so we, you know, we will have exactly the same critique when we do rare variant analysis as we have for common variant analysis in the parts of the genome that we don't understand how to interpret 
properly at this point in time. Now, you know, the efforts in functional genomics and things like, you know, uh, epigenomics roadmap and ENCODE and those kinds of efforts are certainly moving the ball forward in terms of providing some guidelines for the interpretation of what is going on at a biological level with respect to non-coding variation, but we're miles away from the degree of specificity that we have right now in coding variation. Uh, well, there, it's same question? Essentially the same. <laughs> okay, great. So we'll go back to Dennis. Um, do you think um, it makes sense to um, do the case control design like we do this at this point in terms of all of the spectrum disorder, where we have like the high IQ and the low IQ? Would it make, for example, make more sense to take the low IQ autism patients and together with the intellectual disability yeah. patients run a case control design like that and or maybe like, so, so yeah. So where do you where do you cut it, right? I mean, I think that's kind of the nature, the the essential component of your question. Maybe it's that all of one neural de developmental phenotype, which you can cluster much better in terms of or more homogeneous, um, doing more including more variables. So, so we, I, I, I think we have a couple of things that are going on here. Um, at a clinical level, there's an expansion of phenotype with respect to autism spectrum disorders. So. Uh, and that expansion is cutting both ways. It's expanding the number of patients with intellectual disability that get a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorders and the number of patients without intellectual disability are also being caused. So, so there's expansion on both sides. The mixing proportion is less now. So there are comparatively fewer intellectual disability cases within an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis than there were 50 years ago. So there's been a real shift there. Um, how that plays out, it's hard to say. I mean, it, it's worth bearing in mind that you see evidence of common variant risk in patients that have 16 to 11 deletion mutations, right? So these are copy number variants. We get plenty of them. There are, you know, they have an odds ratio of about 20. That means that, you know, one in five patients with that, or one in five individuals with that mutation will have a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorders. It also means that four and five don't. So there's got to be some residual risk there. You know, fully penetrant cases, sure. Um, not so fully penetrant cases, it's kind of a hard judgment. I mean, the kind of power analysis is pretty tough. Uh, it's also worth bearing in mind that it's still a comparatively small set of <coughs> carriers, right? So like, you know, we do the best we can, but it's, you know, it's not a, a huge fraction of our patients are, are falling into these kinds of classifications. So it's not, I'm, I'm, I like a big tent personally, but I think it's more a kind of personal consideration. So is it, I don't know whether it's possible, is it possible to uh, look at the data based on specific, like, phenotypes other than groups and species? Right. Um, so we try. Uh, the specific phenotypic presentation, you know, I, well, what is the saying? Uh, you know, if you've met one patient with autism spectrum disorders, you've met one patient with autism spectrum disorders. I think that's like the kind of classic uh, saying now in the community, right? Yeah. Um, it is possible, it is possible that specific deficits in specific <coughs> domains might yield to more specific biological mechanisms. That is possible. We don't have anywhere close to enough data to be able to make those kinds of assertions or analyses at this point in time. Um, you know, there's a spectrum of risk from rare to common, and there's also, I, I guess the other thing that I bear in mind is that the vast majority of individuals with autism spectrum disorder, or the ma vast major majority of individuals that carry a 16p11 deletion, the phenotypic presentation pretty much recapitulates the full phenotypic diversity that you get in an autism spectrum disorder case classification. So here you've got a major risk factor. You've got something that gives you a one in five shot of ASD. And there's uh, almost the complete range of phenotypic diversity recapitulated within that case population. So it's, it's hard. I mean, I, I, I think it's just one of these things where there are a lot of complex biological processes that are involved. and it's going to take us a long time to get any sort of traction on specific, you know, deficits and, and mechanisms, but it is possible in the fullness of time that we'll, we'll get there. I recently heard that in males and females, different areas of brain are involved uh, or, uh, say, uh, bound to autism spectrum disorder. 
would such stratification help uh, to solve that puzzle? So when we look at males and females from a genetic risk standpoint, uh, females, there's a higher fraction of female patients with autism spectrum disorders um, with these severe de novo mutations. Okay, so the rate of LOFs in females is higher than it is in males. Um, that's also consistent with almost the entirety of the liability distribution being shared between males and females, but there being a mean shift. So being a female is inherently protective, potentially, is you know, possible. And it is, it is consistent with that, that model. We don't see any real disagreement with that model um, it, it explicitly. I don't know if we have enough female cases to look at the common variant landscape uh, for autism <coughs> spectrum disorders to really you know, dig our you know, teeth in there. When we look at other traits like height, where there's a substantial difference in sex, okay? So boys are a lot taller than girls. I think we can all agree that that's, you know, this isn't very controversial. Uh, when we look at the genetic contributions to variability in height in the population, at least with respect to the autosomes, they're pretty much completely shared. So the genetic correlation in common genetic risk factors for height are nearly completely identical between <coughs> males and females. There's a huge degree of similarity. So finessing out what the consequences of being a boy versus being a girl, you know, really are, what those consequences are, is going to be challenging and in some instances it may reflect that there is different structures to the phenotype. In other instances it just means that there's a mean shift that you know, <coughs> getting a lot more estrogen versus testosterone changes things about socialization more more generally, potentially. Okay, well are there any other questions? Well then let's thank Ben one more time. <laughs>